Good afternoon. Um, Dr. Pantamit, uh, Dr. Niamsu, Dr. Choltis, thank you for the invitation extended to me. Um, to all the participants um, who will put up with, with the rest of the day for this symposium. Um, it's a great privilege and honor for me to be sitting here and discussing with you. It's my first time in Thailand, my first time in mainland Southeast Asia. I'm sure this, this will not be the last. Um, so my presentation, uh, my discussion for this afternoon will be about uh, people to people cooperation. But uh, I, I will focus on a certain sector, fisheries. So this, this work uh, is based on earlier work than my, my senior colleague, um, Assistant Professor Daisy C. and I. Um, we, are, we are both uh, looking into maritime issues. I worked in government before uh, on, on maritime issues. I had been working with, with maritime issues uh, after my stint in government uh, as an academic and uh, as a consultant on maritime related issues, mostly security, but uh, recently um, also working at resource issues. So the, this is the outline of my presentation. So I, I will start with providing the context and then um, I will look into the challenges um, for artisanal fishermen. So these are fishers who are small scale uh, compared to the large ocean going, sea going, offshore fishing, uh, which, which I will also in a bit discuss later. And then uh, third, I would look at the openings for people to people cooperation in, in, in the fishery sector. Uh, th these openings that can possibly help uh, small scale or artisanal fishermen. And then Finally, uh, I, I look into proposed actions. Uh, my, my presentation will largely be, of course, drawn from Philippine perspectives, but uh, of course, uh, in, in, in the course of the implementation of the actions, we will also be looking at uh, regional cooperation, especially with neighboring ASEAN countries. So if you look at the context, we see that East Asian countries are among the world's largest consumers as well as producers of uh, fisheries products. Um, however, despite of this uh, sector uh, being uh, booming, uh, benefiting a lot, uh, big, in, big industry fishing interests, the, the small scale artisanal fishermen uh, remain at the bottom. And uh, in the Philippines, uh, artisanal fishermen, small-scale fishermen, remain among the poorest uh, of the poor. So they remain on the fringes of society. So uh, developing programs to, to target uh, small-scale fishermen uh, to improve their living conditions is, is, always, uh, is always one of the core uh, priority programs I, I, in any poverty alleviation programs. Uh, there will always be a segment that will try to target this, this sector for site, the, the small-scale fishermen. And then people-to-people uh, -to -people cooperation um, is important, but uh, we're not discounting, of course, the, the critical role of the state as the facilitator, as the enabler. So the people-to-people -people cooperation, in a way, functions as a complement or as, as a push for a greater state-to-state -state cooperation that can help improve the lot of artisanal fishers. So I, I look at market forces and I look at state-to-state uh, -state cooperation as essential ingredients, you know, essential elements in, in trying to improve the lot of artisanal fishermen. 
So we see that this high fish consumption, uh, East Asia averages about uh, 30 to 60 kilograms of uh, fish protein per, per capita. And um, we could count several uh, East Asian countries as among uh, the world's largest distant fishing states, meaning these are countries that venture farther out into the sea. They go to Western Pacific, they go to as far as Atlantic to fish. And this includes countries like China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and the Philippines. So we have fishing fleets that scar the seven seas uh, to get the fish back home, process it, and uh, some of them gets to be consumed at home, some of them gets to be exported abroad. And there's also a high fisheries trade in the region. So there's a lot of uh, export import uh, intra-region. Uh, except for China, uh, most Northeast Asian countries are net fish importers, meaning that they may, you know, Japan may be fishing abroad, uh, but most of it gets to be consumed at home. Very little gets to be exported. Uh, however, in, in the case of Southeast Asia, the picture is uh, quite different. Um, we, we still have surplus producers like Thailand and Vietnam, so some of the fish that gets to be fished uh, by, by, by these countries end up, some of them end up in, in the export market. And uh, regionally, um, many countries in Southeast Asia are also members of existing regional fisheries management organizations. So these are, these are intergovernmental bodies made to regulate fishing, especially in the high seas. Um, and then there's also existence of bilateral fisheries agreement. Now, uh, I, I cited this uh, market forces and this existing sovereign, this, this existing platforms for cooperation as, as, as avenues that can possibly help artisanal fishers. So here we look at uh, countries like China, Thailand, Vietnam uh, in the list of major uh, exporters and importers of fisheries products. Uh, importer side, we have Japan, China, uh, we'll see Korea and Hong Kong. So these are some of the uh, regional fisheries management organizations. So. If you look at the world, uh, world seas, it's divided into several uh, RFMOs. The goal is to uh, make sure that there's sustainable harvest of fisheries resources, especially in the high seas. So here we would see that the uh, WCPFC, or the West and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, uh, in terms of area, I mean, the whole of the seas of, uh, as far as the coastal Asia, and of course, it, it includes the whole of the insular Southeast Asia, are, are, are part of the WCPFC. So uh, there is a regulation in terms of uh, you know the, the quantity of fish that can be uh, acceptable for harvest in any given year. And member states of this uh, RFMO agree, uh, and then they allocate quota. So. Um, Th these are uh, some of the uh, major RFMOs, and I listed the uh, major regional countries and see how many of them are actually members or uh, taking part in this uh, RFMOs. So we would see that China is uh, a party to almost all, and uh, it's a non-party to one, but most, uh, most RFMOs, it's a party. So you would see that uh, Thailand and the Philippines are also very active as uh, parties to RFMOs. These countries are the major uh, fishing, fishing states and they include distant fishing states. Now bilateral fisheries agreement in, in, in East Asia is also, there's a long history. So, um, beginning around the 90s, some uh, even much earlier. Just go, okay. So uh, we, we have fisheries agreements uh, in, in East Asia, and uh, these are bilateral, and uh, they have a long tradition, long history, and some of them, some of the recent ones are, you know, j just signed a few years back, 
and so so beyond uh, fisheries, uh, we're also increasingly looking at how to improve uh, maritime law enforcement, uh, how to coordinate, how to make sure that uh, fishermen will not be caught in jurisdictional disputes. So, so these are just some of the types of fisheries agreements. Okay, okay. So I, I think uh, my presentation is there, so you, you can just go over it. So, so these are the types of the fisheries agreements. So you, you, you can go over it. Now, um, I would, okay, thank you. So I, I will now proceed with the second, uh, second part, second point, which are the challenges for artisanal fishers. So, of course, the, the, the problem about dwindling fish stocks, especially in coastal waters, forcing many of small-scale fishermen to venture farther out into the sea. Uh, but when, when they do that, of course, they encounter a lot of problems in the process. So there's a huge demand for fisheries, you know, as, as we mentioned in the first part. Uh, in the region, there's a huge demand for fish protein. Um, so this makes com competition for uh, harvesting these resources, especially for uh, commercial and offshore fishing companies, big fishing fleets. Um, they, the small scale fishermen are unable to compete with them because of resource constraints. Uh, they don't have uh, fishing vessels that are bigger or sturdier you know, to go farther out into the sea especially during bad weather. And um, of course the fishing gear, uh, the fuel that you need to, to sustain uh, fishing in, 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 in the high seas for like a week or, or months. So they are disadvantaged in terms of competition with, with the bigger fishing fleets. And uh, there, there's also lack of state support uh, and there's poor organization. Uh, in, in the Philippines, there are very few, uh, we, we have very good big commercial fishing interests. They're quite represented, and, but, but uh, th this kind of organizational resources are absent among small scale or artisanal fishers. So we could see the, the, the wide gap between how organized and how financially capable a big uh, corporate offshore fishing interests are, and when you look at the case for artisanal fishers, so the disparity is really huge. And uh, of course, uh, recently of course we, we have these issues about uh, certain traditional fishing grounds like Scarborough Shoal being the subject of jurisdictional disputes, in this case with, with, with China. So fishermen end up uh, being denied access to, 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 additional, to a traditional fishing ground that the generations before them had been, you know, they, they've been going to that to access it for, for fisheries. So now I will move to the third part, which is uh, looking at the openings for for people-to-people -people cooperation. Uh, I, I'd like to spotlight on the Scarborough Shoal, or we call it Bajo de Masinlo. We have, we, locals, we have many names for it. But Bahao de Masinlok or Panatag Shoal is, is one of the most useful names we refer to, we, we refer that feature to. So uh, th there's a case for turning the sea of divide into to a sea that binds. So artisanal fishers, uh, even before the 2012 standoff we have with, 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 with our neighbor China, um, the fishermen from uh, Philippines, Vietnam, even Taiwan and in mainland China, uh, all go to fish in, in that uh, feature, which is about 150 square kilometers. It's quite big. So it's because it's shallow waters inside the lagoon. Uh, it's a rich, uh, it's a teeming ground, breeding ground for a wide variety of fishes. And these are usually the high value species, like snappers and groupers, which always command a high price 
especially if you sell them in uh, fresh in Hong Kong or coastal cities like Shanghai. So uh, before before the dispute we have with China in 2012, so all fishermen from from these four countries go there to fish. But we know what happened in 2012, and from that time until only recently, 2016 where Filipino fishermen were able to re, uh, renew access to, to, to this fishing ground. So for, from 2012 to 2016, it was largely closed to Filipino fishermen. So this affected uh, many small-scale artisanal fishermen based in northwestern Luzon, like the province of, uh, provinces of uh, Zambales, Bataan, and Pangasinan. So, in, 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 in the town of Masinlok alone, uh, we have around 4,000 fishermen who depend on access to the Scarborough Shoal for their livelihood. So, so we could only imagine the impact of uh, the dispute and the fact that they can no longer go there and fish, uh, how it affected their, their, their livelihood. So this is just one town and 4,000 fishers depend on it. And we have about three or four provinces with coastal towns that depend on access to Scarborough Shoal. So uh, in 2016, uh, the, there's an award that was made by the arbitration. And it says that uh, the Scarborough Shoal is actually, it was affirmed that it was a traditional fishing ground, not only for Filipino fishermen, but also for fishermen from China and Vietnam. So I, I, I think that this provides an opening for, for cooperation, not only between Philippines and China, but also with Vietnam, and also possibly with other countries. You know? So, and also at the present, the uh, leadership under the Duterte administration has a large preference or inclination towards managing disputes and exploring functional and resource cooperation. And this would include a possible a tentative fishing agreement with, with China and Vietnam over the Scarborough Shoal. And uh, there had been two instances in the past, recent past, 2016 and 2017, when fishermen from Vietnam were caught fishing in uh, territorial waters of the Philippines uh, off the coast of Pangasinan. This is a province in northwestern Luzon. So, um, Instead of pressing charges on them and you know seizing their catch and seizing their boat, what our president did was to personally make sure that they will be able to go back to their home country and all charges against them will be uh, withdrawn. So again, this shows that uh, the preference of uh, the government to, to try to not make a big issue out of a fishing incident. And uh, of course, there are existing regional bodies like uh, uh, Southeast Asia Fisheries Development Center, which is based in Bangkok. Um, so it's an intergovernmental uh, organization that uh, promotes fishing as well as aquaculture. So uh, we, we have that, we, we have private sector. There's a community of marine experts, uh, marine research scientists in the region, uh, as well as NGOs that we're looking to tap. We're, we're, we're trying to leverage on our uh, ASEAN linkages and connections on the science side and the fishery side to help us find ways to not only conserve and conserve and promote the resources in, in that traditional fishing ground, but also make sure that uh, there's a way to sustainably harvest it. Okay, so, so these are some of the proposed actions. Um, so I am personally working, I, I have some consulting and research at the site. So I'm working with, with some, some groups that are looking into rehabilitating the damaged coral reefs in the Scarborough Shoal. It was badly damaged in 2012 when China uh, uh, occupied it, I mean, virtually occupied and controlled the feature. So some of the corals and big clams were uh, destroyed. Um, so we're, we're trying to, to find ways to partner with uh, existing institutions 
uh, within the region as well as locally um, to to look into conservation the there was a proposal made by our president to try to consider Scarborough Shoal as a marine sanctuary. Of course, the, it uh, merited some resistance from artisanal fishermen because if a marine sanctuary means that they can no longer go there and fish, uh, it would affect, again, the livelihood of fishermen. So the it's, government is trying to, to consult, you know, to consult with artisanal fishermen and to find ways to balance between uh, livelihood and at the same time keeping marine resources for posterity. Uh, again, it's not, diff it's not an easy balance to make. Um, right now, we, we are also uh, under discussion. We have a tentative fisheries agreement with, with, with China. And uh, part of the agreement uh, is with, with our Coast Guards, uh, Philippine and Chinese Coast Guards, um, coming to terms with some basic, uh, we, now have, we now have set up a hotline communications. So that means that um, incidents at the sea, including our fishermen, uh, they will be communicated on the ground immediately before they became a diplomatic crisis. So we're trying to, to manage disputes so that the fishermen, the small scale fishermen, uh, who are largely unaware of these diplomatic disputes, their livelihood will not will, will be spared. It will be largely unaffected. And then uh, there is a proposal to organize our fishermen, uh, especially those dependent on on the Scarborough Shoal for fishing. So th the goal is to, to to organize them and to find ways to offer them alternative sources of livelihood, so that during the off season of uh, fishing season uh, the off uh, fishing season in Scarborough Shore, they they can still you know sustain themselves and their family. So we're looking at uh, private sector to provide capital, seed capital and training for aquaculture and fish farming and alternative sources of livelihood related to uh, you know fisheries, especially for so that you know the the their inability to access the fishing ground in Scarborough Shoal during the off fishing season will, will not be uh, much, it will not create much of an adverse effect on, on, on their families and on the coastal communities dependent on, on the Scarborough Shoal. And I understand that countries like, like Thailand and Vietnam have developed very good technologies in terms of aquaculture. And we're hoping to also look into best practices you know, that we can bring at home and you know, try to uh, try to provide this kind of training and technologies to uh, fishermen, artisanal fishermen in the area. So th these are some of the conclusion that uh, that uh, we made. So people-to-people -people cooperation is very important. Uh, however, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, the role of uh, governments, you know, to, to to jumpstart, you know, to kickstart the process of people-to-people -people cooperation is, is very important. And then we, we have, of course, other players like uh, you know, private sector, uh, NGOs. Um, so th this kind of communities, you know, the communities of scholars, of scientists, of fisheries experts, they can actually help uh, in addressing this problem, trying to help artisanal fishermen. So their role is very important. And uh, th there is a sense of optimism now that with the present leadership uh, in the Philippines, which is uh, seen as more pragmatic, as seen as more uh, results oriented, um, can have more impact in trying to uh, advance you know, the interest of small scale fishermen and make sure that uh, in any political or sovereign disputes with, with neighbors, uh, they will be the last group of people that will suffer. I will end there and I will welcome your questions. Thank you.
how big of the fisher industry is in the Philippines? And how many percent of the GDP come from this kind of industry? Um, agriculture traditionally is a strong contributor to, to our economy. But improvement in other sectors like services, especially services, and then manufacturing is picked up. But uh, I would say around 20, over 20 percent is still agriculture. The percentage of fisheries within that agricultural sector is, is much smaller. So uh, we have uh, big commercial fishing interests, but uh, um, the, their contribution is not much. But if you look at the, how many people depend on small-scale fishing, uh, it's a lot. We, we are a maritime country, an archipelagic country of about 7,107 islands. So in every coastal community, you would see fishermen, many of them small-scale, uh, many of them artisanal fishermen. So they still use traditional forms of fishing. So they don't harvest much. They don't get to store them. You know, they don't get to export them. Um, so it's usually for just their personal consumption and whatever little excess they sell to the market. But uh, so it's, it's very uh, community based, small scale that, you know, census people tend not to, to capture. So sometimes they won't reflect on the, on the data. But, uh, but uh, ag again, in, in one town, we have around 4,000 fishermen fishing on uh, just this feature in Scarborough Shoal. So I would imagine it's, it would be by the hundreds of thousands if we got every coastal community with fishermen. Uh, perhaps you know about the uh, uh, IUU, you know, you mm. go unreported and what? Unregulated and yeah, unreported. Unregulated. Because we get the uh, yellow ticket from EU, that's why we have to improve our legislation, especially uh, about artisanal fishing and deep sea fishing. Uh, I, I'd like to see uh, your perhaps uh, comments and suggestions on this matter. Uh, and I'd like to ask BDM for you. What does it stand for in, in the slide? BDM. Ah, BDM, sorry. Okay. And for us, you know, uh, the, the regional uh, organization seems thing seems very common. But uh, the others that you have mentioned that uh, we are not parties, perhaps uh, you can uh, elaborate uh, which one we should join, and especially for the you know, like you said, you have a tentative fishery agreement with China, whether we should have a kind of multilateral agreement so that it's. Uh, prevent any uh, uh, dispute, uh, especially as you said, the uh, kind of ASEAN code of conduct, you know, on the, uh, on the, all, all the like South China Sea, or I think you prefer to call West Filipino Sea, right? <laughs> right, so uh, Scarborough Shore or that. And what, uh, after the uh, arbitral award in 2016, whether it's, uh, can, uh, because I, it seems China didn't, uh, recognize that, and what what you are uh, next step for for this uh, uh, matter <coughs> after you put it in the uh, you know arbitral uh, in um, international arbitral uh, court of arbitral and what what else you 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 think you should uh, proceed this? Thank you. Okay, uh, that's quite a lot of questions. <laughs> sure, um, I, I'll try to answer uh, them as much as I can. So I'll start with the IUU fishing, so the illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing. So uh, like Thailand, we also suffered, uh, no, we, we, we were threatened by Europe that we, they will deny access to Filipino fisheries products in European markets if we will not be able to comply with this IUUF. So what we did was to make a change in our domestic fisheries legislation to, to, to try to define IUUF and to try to strengthen uh, uh, fisheries law enforcement agencies um, to make sure that uh, the legal compliance 
is matched by you know by implementation on the ground. So um, since then, uh, the sanctions, you know, the, the threat to to cut access to European markets for Filipino fisheries products was lifted. So we were able to resume export to to Europe. Um, the BDM is uh, Bajo de Masidlok. So it means, it's a Spanish term, but uh, in English it would mean like Lower Masinloc. So Masinloc is a town, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a municipality in Sambales. Sambales is a province. So uh, Scarborough Show, internationally known as Scarborough Show, we call it locally Bajo de Masinloc, but the local people there call it Carboro or Panatag Show. Panatag means peaceful because uh, the waters outside the shoal is, because this is already like 124 nautical miles from land. So uh, during times of bad weather, the waves can really be high, like three or four meters high. But if you went inside the lagoon, it's still calm and still. So that's why the name goes Panatag, which is peaceful or, or calm. So we, uh, there are many local names for it, but internationally it's Carbo Shoal. Officially, we call it Bajo de Masinloc, BDM. Now, uh, in relation to RFMOs, um, so this slide shows that uh, Thailand is actually a party to one, but not party to the rest. This doesn't mean that Thailand is not fishing in, 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 in these areas. So, but if they fish, it may have consequences for, for Thai fishing companies. Because if they are not party to uh, these uh, fishing conventions, then uh, if, if, if their fishing fleets run into problems, uh, well, uh, members, members of the RFMOs you know, can raise this issue with Thailand. Like, we, we are complying. If you agree with the RFMO, there, there's a set of guidelines that you, you have to tell your fishing fleets you know, to comply. And uh, of course, you cannot deny others from, from, from fishing, especially these are high seas areas. But if they will not comply and others are complying, then uh, you know, other member states will, will raise this matter with Thailand. So uh, I think it's in the best interest of Thailand to look into, to consider uh, becoming members of this uh, other regional fisheries management organizations so that uh, the entry of Thai fishing fleets into these other high seas areas to fish uh, won't create uh, pos potential complications. Uh, now on, on, on the COC, I think Irene will, will be able to give more justice to this question. But, but my take on the COC, uh, now the, the code of conduct for the South China Sea is, is a long drawn process. It's, it has been there, the, the, the intent, you know, the intent to try to manage the disputes in the South China Sea so that it won't affect, you know, fishermen, so, so that tensions and uh, tensions will be managed and overall relations will not be, will be, uh, will not be affected. So I think the goal of the Code of Conduct is noble, but, but the fact that it dragged too long and accomplished too little uh, tells us how how difficult the South China Sea still is. Um, you know, we, we know that in 2014, a significant change on the ground happened when China put up uh, artificial islands, build up artificial islands. And this, this change in the ground really affected, that, in a way, the tempo and, uh, of the COC. So some countries are saying that uh, because of this fight accompli, meaning China already accomplished what it intended to do, there is little impetus to, to, for, for a COC. But curiously, uh, China is actually active in trying to push for the code of conduct, maybe because they are now coming from a position of strength. And uh, because of the improved relations between Philippines and China, we are also supportive of a code of conduct. But so far, we made a declaration, we made a code of conduct, but it, it appears that the recent gain that we had was a framework, a framework for a COC. And if you look at the framework, it's, it's, 
it didn't have much difference from 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 the past. So, if if we're looking at these negotiations as you know steps moving forward, you know you know there's a lot of criticism that not much has improved. In fact, uh, so uh, on paper, country seems to be like discussing, negotiating, but in terms of actual substance, uh, not much. Um, now, uh, on the question of the arbitral award, domestically, the Duterte administration is being criticized for being too soft on China, for not asserting or raising the ruling, or not using it uh, in, in, you know, in, in the dispute. But uh, I, I, my, my take, my opinion is that uh, Given the difficulty of the enforcement, you may have the landmark historic ruling, but there is actually no agency that will implement it, that will enforce it. And you will be enforcing it against the world's second largest economy. Um, so I think the calculation of Duterte is that, and this is, my, my, this is just my take, I, I think there is an effort to implement parts of the award without saying so. So now, I, I, if we review again the, the, the crucial points of the award, you know, the first one, it says that the historic rights, you know, rights that are derived outside the Punklos are invalid already. So that means China's nine dash line doesn't have basis under international law. The, the second is that none of the features in the South China Sea qualifies as an island. Therefore, they cannot generate 200 nautical miles EEZ. That means there will be no overlaps, and there will be no problem if we, uh, you know, extract and harness the resources, fisheries and oil and gas in, in the area within our exclusive economic zone. And third point, uh, the, the the award said that the China interfered with Philippine resource activities in the area when they had us fishermen, when they had us. Oil, in, oil exploration conducted by Philippine companies. So, I, I, I think in the in the areas of fisheries, we are. You know, uh, I, I had mentioned earlier that both sides are. They have now entered into rules uh, to avoid uh, fishing incidents. So, coordination between coast guards of both sides, our hotline communications. Uh, are, are there to, uh, in a way, try to address this problem. And two, after the state visit of our president in October 2016 to Beijing, days after that, uh, Filipino fishermen were able to go to Scarborough Shoal again to fish. Initially, we were able to fish outside the fringes of the shoal, but uh, uh, later on, we were able to enter inside the lagoon. So uh, Filipino fishermen are able to fish again in the Scarborough Shoal. And this brought relief to many small-scale fishermen. So, um, and I think third, there has not been any major incident involving, uh, I mean, Chinese interference in, in our activities in the Kalayan. In, in, we call it Kalayan Islands, internationally known as Pratlis. So we, we have people living there. We have fishermen, you know, uh, fishing there. So we never had any incident with, 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 with China recently. No. Now, uh, of course, there was one or two incidents where uh, involving fishing. But, but on the main, from October of 2016 up until this day, uh, most of these incidents, a couple of incidents, they have been managed very well. So I think the part of the arbitral award that says about resource rights of the Philippines and uh, telling China not to interfere with the exercise of those rights. I, I think they are being, in a way, enforced. But of course, we, we're not saying that, that China is doing it because they're complying. Maybe China has a way of, you know, China is saying that it's allowing all of these things have to happen out of their own goodwill. Now, we, we let them do how they communicate with their domestic public. But, but as far as we're concerned, uh, these efforts show that we are in some way moving forward with enforcement, but w w we're trying not to we're trying not to cry out loud and say that you know 
hey, we got China complying with the award. Uh, we're trying to provide a graceful and honorable face-saving uh, way for China to, to comply without actually legally complying. Uh, again, it's, 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 it's difficult. Um, so we have that uh, on the fishery side. We were able to resume fishing. We had very few incidents related to fishing, and those incidents, wherever they prop up, they are easily managed. Uh, the big, the next big thing on the resources is the proposed joint development. So presently, both sides are are considering a framework that will allow uh, joint exploration. And if resources prove that you know if they are considerable uh, commercially viable resources, then the likely progression is development. I mean, extraction of those resources. Uh, but we have constitutional requirements. Of, we have constitutional constraints from the Philippine side, and there's pressure that the award makes it difficult for us to partner with China, because the award is very clear that there's no contest it's within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. And allowing China to take part in any joint development in our EEZ is like acquiescing or acknowledging China's rights, which was already invalidated by the ruling. So the, the difficult part there is that uh, the president wants to ensure energy security, wants to ensure resource access for Philippine fishermen. Um, uh, com uh, unlike Malaysia, Indonesia, or Vietnam, Philippines is more than 95% dependent on foreign energy for our energy requirements. And we will, like, uh, uh, Brunei is, is a major exporter. So among our neighbors in insular Southeast Asia, we are actually the only one uh, not endowed much with, with hydrocarbon resources. So we have to import a lot. And the few fields, the, the few operating fields on uh, where we get oil and gas, most of them are clustered in the West Philippine Sea, in the disputed area. Uh, we have a big natural gas field. Uh, we call it Malampaya. Now, that gas field supplies about 40% of the energy requirements of Luzon, our biggest island. So our biggest island, where our capital city is located, is dependent on one field called Malampaya, which is based in West Philippine Sea, being disputed by China. And that field will be exhausted in about five to seven years. So we will understand why Duterte is trying to, you know, he only has like four more years in power. So if he has to make big decisions, he has to do it in the next three to four years. Otherwise, the next, the, the, the remainder of his five to six years, he will be a lame duck president. So if he has to make decisions, the window is closing fast. So he has to make this in, in, in his third this year up until the fourth year. Otherwise, it, it will be very difficult for, for him to, to push for any, any, any measure to actually extract resources there. And while we have the award, the enforcement is difficult. And any effort to unilaterally extract resources there will, of course, merit consternation or adverse reaction on the part of China. We try to attract big players like ExxonMobil, Shell, the, the big ones, to, to try to invest in our offshore energy in, in that area. But all of them uh, decided to stay out. And again, we, we could see the pressure from Beijing, uh, you know, telling them that they, they have larger business interests in China than in the Philippines. And if, if they decide to you know, become a service contractor in the Philippine energy uh, system, which in, in a way acknowledges Philippine sovereignty or sovereign rights over our EASA, that means that they may lose part of their business, that some of their businesses in China might be affected. So that's why we cannot attract big players. So we only get to see mid-sized players, but they don't have much technology for deep water exploration. They don't have much finance and industry track record. That's why there are people in the industry saying that a joint development with China will actually send a strong industry signal 
that you know a partnership with China will eliminate the political risk and make it uh, make it attractive to big players to come in, like Chevron and ExxonMobil. I'm sorry, I talk too much. for your presentation. I have a uh, quick uh, question. Uh, since the rise of uh, President Duterte, we have seen that Philippine foreign uh, policy in many ways it departs from the traditional Philippine playbook. I mean, uh, they try to distance themselves from the Washington audit and moving closer towards uh, China. So my question is, uh, will this be a long-term trend for the country? The most difficult questions are the questions that are really outside my, outside the topic discussed. Yeah, I understand. Um, I, I worry about the swings in Philippine foreign policy. During the time of former President Arroyo, we were also in a way close to China. And then we had a sharp swing uh, against China when the new leadership change, new leadership change came about. And, and, and now again, we, with the new administration, we seem to be again uh, veering away, away from the West and more into to, to Asia, more to, to, Ch to China for instance, as well as Russia. I, I think over the years, you know, the Philippines, you know, unlike, unlike the rest of Southeast Asia, I would argue that Philippines is, in a way, the most Western-oriented among Southeast Asian states, with the exception of Singapore. But I don't know. But, but uh, I think that's changing. That's changing. The, 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 the changing dynamics of U.S.-China relations, you know, the fact that China continues to rise economically, while U.S., some say, hit already a plateau uh, and is already in decline. So if you are a leader of a Southeast Asian country and you see all of your neighbors uh, you know, expanding relations with China economically, despite issues, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei are also claimants, including Vietnam in the South China Sea. But then again, they have good relations with, with China. So, so the lesson that you can draw there is that you need not resolve the disputes to have good relations with China. I mean, you can have good neighborly relations with China without surrendering your position or your claims. So I, I think slowly, uh, recent Philippine administrations are, are realizing that we have to find a way to compartmentalize the dispute so that it won't affect the larger scope of the relations. I mean, Philippine-China relations uh, is larger than speck of rocks or you know waters. I mean, they're important, but uh, we should not allow them to be the front driver in the relations. So. So I, I think we're moving more towards uh, uh, to, towards that kind of approach, managing disputes so that uh, we, we can expand the relations with China. But I wouldn't say that uh, our foreign policy is, is going tilting towards more towards China. I, I think it's more more Asian th th than, than actually China. Uh, in the two years of the President Duterte's administration, he has yet to make a visit to a Western capital. I heard there are, there are invitations for him to visit Washington. He already declined the invitation to go to Canberra. So uh, and it's very unusual uh, for a Filipino leader, a Filipino president, not to make a visit to US, especially in his first 100 days in office, in his first year in office. It's something of a tradition, something like a must. But he's already in second year in power, but he has yet to decide whether to go to Washington or, or, or Europe. Um, Duterte became a speaker, uh, invited, was invited as a keynote speaker in the POAO Forum in Hainan uh, recently. And in that speech, in his speech, he mentioned that the future of the Philippines lies in Asia. I, I think it's a very strong statement. Uh, I think that statement tells uh, tells a lot of people about the direction of his foreign policy. But, but to say that he is anti-West, I think is also too much. Um, you know, despite of his rhetoric against the West, 
our relations with the West continue. Our military exercises with U.S. continues. Our military security cooperation with Australia continues. So even though he decides not to go there personally, he would be sending his foreign affairs secretary. He would be sending his national security advisor. So our secretary of foreign affairs, our defense secretary, our national security advisor, the three of them, which are, they occupy very crucial portfolios in the government. They already paid a visit to Australia, once in Hawaii, and then in Washington, D.C. So it means that Duterte may have personal reasons against the U.S., but he is not allowing his personal reasons to affect national interests. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Luis Speakers from Singapore, uh, Ms. Eileen Chan, she is an associate research fellow with the China program in the S. Raja Ragnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological Universities. Please welcome. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Irene Chan from Singapore, uh, the S. Roger Annam School of International uh, Studies. And uh, thank you. I would like to uh, express my sincerest thanks to the hosts um, from, from the Chiang Mai uh, ASEAN Center so, um, for all that you have done for us. And, um, and it's, a good, it's a great pleasure to be, to be back in, in this beautiful city again. Um, okay, um, although uh, Lucio previously mentioned a lot about me, you know, where I can answer questions about uh, the, 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 the South China Sea and, and stuff like that, um, I, I'm going to refrain from, from this. Um, today my presentation is going to be focused on... Um, oops, is it? Today my presentation is going to be focused on um, a people-centered ASEAN, and we are gonna look, uh, I'm going to look at... Um, Singapore's contribution to ASEAN's social, cultural, community building. Um, this is not um, what I do for my daily job, um, because right now I'm a researcher where I look at more, most, mostly at geopolitics. But before I joined, um, before I joined, um, you know, um, a, a think tank, um, the, my, my think tank, uh, about ten years ago, I was actually a a, a school teacher. So, you know, um, education and youth is, uh, you know, these two topics are something that is dear to my heart. So I'm going to give you my, my uh, I'm going I'm to give my best to, to, to present to you, you know, what are our contributions to, 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 to ASEAN. So, this is the outline uh, of my presentation. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to be uh, looking quite a bit at uh, uh, not not in very not in very big, great details, um, but I'm going to give you you know some some sort of an overview of uh, education and youth and uh, Singapore's com contributions uh, towards all these. And um, I'm going to talk about um, Singapore's um, chairmanship year um, in uh, this year and the things that we are trying to to uh, the things that the country is trying to do to sort of promote more uh, to promote people to people uh, connectivity. So in so let me let me start. So Singapore is actually um, what what we call a, a quiet facilitator for for regional community building initiatives. Um, although it's like better known for its lead role in ensuring you know um, in, in in leading in being the leading economy in in, in ASEAN and uh, and in ensuring uh, ASEAN uh, contributing a lot in ensuring ASEAN's. Uh, economic relevance, uh, relevance on the global platform. Um, Singapore realizes that there is a crucial need to boost the, the region's overall capacity, especially um, in human resource, um, you know, or, or rather we can call it human capital. And in order to keep up with our competitiveness 
um, vis a vis other emerging regions such as uh, Latin America and South Asia, uh, Central Asia, and all this. Um, so, um, in as early as uh, in 2000, in, uh, in, yeah, in 2000, Singapore led the launching of an initiative for ASEAN uh, integration, the AIA, at the fourth um, informal ASEAN summit. And then it's also done quite a bit to increase. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details uh, for for the for the AIA because it's quite an old uh, it's quite an old initiative, but it's one of the starting initiatives where we were trying to you know um, move deeper into into uh, regionalism and into ASEAN integration um, because that was also the year where we also started with um, the ASEAN uh, the ASEAN F uh, FTA if I'm not wrong uh, and then after that. Um, where I will go about talking is, you know, um, Singapore actually does quite a bit to, um, for, to provide ASEAN uh, scholarships for the younger, uh, the, the, the youth in, in, in ASEAN. So we start um, with high school and or pre-university scholarship programs. Um, these programs, uh, this, there, there are three, three of such programs. Um, the first program would be the the first program is the longest program, is the six-year program, where you start at age 13, and you we, we start at uh, age 13, and then you progress all the way until uh, you are age 19. Before, um, in, you will last, uh, you will end your education uh, in Singapore with a uh, GCE A level, which is uh, offered by, uh, which is a standard um, examination uh, offered by the. Cambridge University. So basically we, 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 we offer this. And then for those uh, older uh, teenagers, we have the uh, four-year program when they come in at, um, at 15 year old, which is a secondary three. Um, uh, secondary three, um, then they start studying all the way until the, the junior college level. And then, um, and then after that, then we have the, the, the 18 year olds who will come in just to study your, just to study um, pre-university entrance, and then you get the A levels and you go into university. So at the university level, um, you, the universities in, in Singapore, um, particularly my university, the NTU, um, we order, we, we offer ASEAN uh, undergraduate scholarships <coughs> as well. So um, basically, a lot of my friends, um, my peers, benefited from this, and um, I have friends who basically spend uh, half of their growing adult life uh, of their, since uh, 13 years old all the way until now in, in, in Singapore because they have, been, they have benefited from, from this uh, program, uh, from, from all these programs. Uh, however, there's a catch. The scholarship is not free, meaning you have to serve, you have to sort of um, be committed to spend at least six years or even longer um, in service um, in employment in Singapore, so that would you know, so so basically that would give you uh, uh, then you will contribute back to the, the the Singapore economy in that way. So it doesn't matter what you what you work as, which industry they, they um, the the Singapore government doesn't dictate which industry you 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 go to. But I think most of the time, um, you know, uh, you have to fulfill that that minimum period. And, and I have friends who, 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 who are doing that as well. But then again, here, you know, all these things come um, as a, as a, presents a challenge to, 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 to Singapore because um, at this stage, people are complaining about, um, people are complaining about, you know, this, this kind of cross-border supply in the form of, you know, mobility of the natural person. They're, they're complaining that it's uh, leading to a brain drain in our neighboring countries because everybody, most of the people who come who get educated in, in, in Singapore want to stay, you know, because uh, as compared to going home to uh, the rest of Southeast Asian countries, you don't earn as much, you know. Um, it's, not, it's not as, uh, when it comes to standard of living and all that, it's not as comfortable um, because they are used to certain ways of living in Singapore. So it leads to, it leads to some form of a brain drain for, for the rest of the Southeast Asian countries, um, but it also leads to domestic um, um, dissatisfaction because the government will say uh, because the people will say that the government is importing all these people to come in and compete and, and Singaporeans uh, 
bear in mind all these scholarships are not offered for Singaporeans. As in locals don't 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 get these. I mean locals have other forms of scholarships uh, which are which are not easy to get. Yeah. So so you know this in turn uh, you know create creates a bit of um, uh, a bit of social, political, uh, domestic pressure on, on the government. Then after that, um, I'm going to continue on with uh, other forms of uh, contribution that Singapore has, uh, has been giving, uh, not, not, on a, not on a high profile because um, perhaps the, the, the funding is a bit smaller as compared to what the, the, the Chinese are giving uh, or what the Japanese are giving, but nevertheless these are uh, still very much in existence is the uh, one of them is the Singapore Cooperation uh, Program. This is uh, this is uh, this is this program is administered by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and mainly for um, government officials from other countries, uh, especially uh, in the developing world. So usually they, they provide uh, technical assistance um, and 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 human resource uh, development, and they have about thirty. Um, international and local partners so all our all our government ministries are, um, are highly involved in, in all this so when we get when we get officials coming from other countries they will do a showcase uh, they'll be brought around to the different various ministries key ministries uh, particularly uh, the, the economic uh, sectors and, and private sectors you know to to, to, to showcase um, the, you know uh, what Singapore has done and how it can be done. So um, the last count that we have um, was that um, 117,000 uh, government officials from 117 uh, 70 countries have benefited from 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 the uh, SCP program. And um, personally, I know a few of them who 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 um, one of my friends from uh, Kazakhstan. She's a she's a an economic official. She came over and she said, you know, she really learned a lot. And she she went back and she tried to. You know, share the experience, and she tried to share some of um, some of the, the 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 policies and all that. But um, of course, you know, nothing can be transferred, you know, um, wholesale. But but you know, it's kind of telling that people are sharing this um, what what they take away from Singapore. So the another very um, prominent, uh, at least in Singapore, um, is. Um, is the Singapore International Foundation. This is more of um, cultural and social and arts um, uh, foundation where, where they promote a lot more of people to people connectivity. And one of my bosses, uh, no, my, my, my big boss is uh, actually the, the chairman of this uh, international foundation. I'm going to play you the, the video so that you can you know, get more info from there. I bring up the volume. Oops. I'm sorry, can you bring up the volume? How do you bring up the volume? It's a bit soft. Um, yeah, I, because I'm running a bit out of time, so I'm just going to stop there. But um, if you are very interested in, 
in uh, the work that the SIF does, um, I would encourage you to, to go to their website and they have more information on um, the various programs that, that they do. Um, it stretches, um, it ranges from uh, you know, um, water purification for, for poorer um, villages in, in Cambodia all the way to um, arts promotion, you know, teaching children how to, how to draw, how to use art to express themselves and how to use art to, to, to um, foster a community um, it's, and, and also to, to, uh, to entrepreneurship. So it's, it's, it's extremely wide ranging, so I'm not going to give you a, 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 a too much of a, an introduction on this. Uh, okay, I'm going to go very quickly about um, ASEAN's, uh, uh, Singapore's uh, Championship for 2018. Um, we have done very. Uh, we are launching three initiatives um, in support of uh, ASEAN youth. Um, we are we have well given about five million Sing dollars. It's not a lot, um, you know, um, to renew the uh, Singapore ASEAN Youth Youth Fund. Um, basically, youth from around ASEAN can actually apply for this fund, um, you know, and then after that uh, to promote uh, the the people to people connectivity and and. Uh, and, and all that and you it's, it's open to it's open to use in in the entire ASEAN it's not just open to officials um, and then after that um, quite interesting thing that uh, in line with what we are in line with uh, Singapore's theme of being uh, resilient and innovative is um, we are going to have an inaugural ASEAN eSports tournament this is a tournament where basically it's a gaming tournament so uh, where youths will challenge each other and and learn sportsmanship uh, through gaming, you know, through 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 through, through some kind of um, uh, RPG games and, and, and stuff like that, and then uh, and then after that we have the we don't have much I don't have much information on this, but it's a youth fellowship program um, where we get the youth le uh, the youth leaders to come in to learn uh, more about um, the the ASEAN uh, structure, the mechanism, and to uh, interact with with the the adult ASEAN leaders. Right. Um, so right now, um, you know, why am I talking about youth and you know the importance of youth is that um, we we should you know harness the the uh, the youth to 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 f to build that uh, identity and and homogeneity in in not homogeneity in in, in our common uh, to have a common identity because in in ASEAN Vision twenty twenty five we. We lay out very clearly that you know we 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 are now supposedly an ASEAN community. Um, we we want to have a forward-looking roadmap, um, you know, to, to have a community that is politically <coughs> co uh, cohesive, economy, econ economically integrated, and socially responsible. Um, but then again, it's still uh, this common identity is still very elusive. So because of our very uh, vast differences in, in our culture, in our economic uh, uh, strengths and all that. So the emphasis, you know, as usual, is always on continuous process. You know, you encourage regional uh, participation from different national perspectives and priorities. Um, but a few of us um, researchers were, were actually thinking, it doesn't always have to be all 10 countries uh, seeking this common identity all the time. It can be you know, um, maybe three or four countries closer, having a closer uh, identity and then after that reaching out, you know, we can start small, we don't need to start with all ten. And then, um, and then after that, you know, there, 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 there is a need to be more effective in targeting interest groups for a, a constructive discourse. So I single out the use of social media as, as, one, of, uh, as, as one of them because everybody, most people have smartphones nowadays and it's easier for and, and especially the youth, you're, you're glued to your, your smartphone, you're glued to social media. So why not we harness, you know, um, popular bloggers, right? So again, uh, we, we don't need to start with the political identity, but we can start with, you know, social cultural. So um, these two are screenshots that I took from uh, two very, very popular um, bloggers in, in Singapore. Um, they are, uh, w the one on the left, uh, the picture is on... Uh, is, is in Phuket and actually um, there are youths from or, or, or rather young people, young adults from from, uh, from Thailand commenting on the blog saying hey that's my hometown you know uh, oh wow you're enjoying my hometown you know beautiful girl in my hometown uh, it's, it's this is the best place to be around this is how you get people to connect 
And then after that, the one on the right where he's holding, where she's holding a, a drink, uh, Te, te Kota, um, she's actually an Indonesian that's based in Singapore. And, you know, she gave, uh, and, the, and the scenery that she has behind is uh, Raja Ampat, it's uh, one of the islands, uh, one of the islands, uh, very beautiful islands in, in a very distant part of uh, 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 Indonesia. And then after that, she gave, you know, she gave a, a very good write-up about um, the different places, the food that she, she eats, the things that she drinks. So I think, you know, we can use, we can make effective use of, of uh, use and, and social media in, 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 in that way. But then again, you know, social media, of course, will come about with, with a lot of challenges. You know, you have, instead of use using social media for, for greater good, you have use getting radicalized, you know, uh, and, and, and getting recruited online by, you know, by, by terrorist groups or, or some uh, criminal uh, gangs. So, you know, then there's a rise in, in, in cyber crimes. The youth are getting targeted uh, for, for <coughs> sexual predation, for scams and, 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 and all that. So Singapore, um, we, Singapore is also trying to come up with a uh, collective uh, effort, you know, in line with uh, its uh, theme of uh, resilience and, and, and innovation uh, to, to, to manage this. So uh, not only is, us, uh, is, is Singapore the, the ASEAN chair this year, it's also the chair for uh, EMRI, which is the ASEAN ministers responsible for information. So um, from last year to this, uh, from this year to next year, and then after that we have um, the theme for 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 our uh, uh, for our um, cha chairmanship for this Emory. Um, we are trying to have uh, Singapore is trying to have inclusive and informed digital ASEAN. So this is again, you know, tying up very much in line with our. Um, our chairmanship year, overall chairmanship year of uh, innov innovation and resilience. So, you know, the goals proposed are, you know, you have to grow the, the okay, I'm not, I'm not going to read this. Can you, can you see it? Yeah, we have, we have three goals. Um, because I'm, I'm very short of time, 20 minutes is up already. So I would leave you to, to read about the, the three goals from, from my slides. So, uh, Thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to your questions, and I'll try my very best to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Harriet. And now I come to the floor for the questions from the Pakistan. For Singapore International Foundation, where but the money come from to support the, the activities? Yeah, this is the this is the question that a lot of us get asked. Um, of course, we have government support, but um, the SIF also does um, a lot of fundraising. So they have a lot of fundraising programs, and we have also private donors uh, for 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 this. Um, the the main thing about um, SIF when it was first set up was that it was supposed to mainly reach out to, to Singaporeans overseas. But as we reach out, uh, as, as, as the, 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 the government, um, you know, top down reaching out to, to Singaporeans overseas, we begin to discover that, oh, you know, I'm, uh, Singaporeans are overseas doing um, volunteer work or, or staying in certain local communities and helping out and all that so they, they decided to have uh, they decided to sort of a switch and also have yet another dimension to, to, to support some of these uh, Singaporeans uh, that are you know doing uh, doing really good projects for, for social good in, in, in around the region or around the world yeah yeah I hope that answers your question oh yes I'm sorry to ask them why you give up the school teacher job. Uh, very, it's kind of personal. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I, I don't mind sharing. It's just that um, I think when uh, when I was when I was doing my bachelor's degree, my my professor, my lecturer at that point in time opened up my eyes to to international relations, geopolitics, 
and and I'm a my undergraduate I was trained as a in, in history. So I, I see you know the greater world out there. Although I did enjoy my work as a as a as a teacher, um, I felt that um, I would like to be more involved in in or rather in whatever little way I can in, in you know Singapore's outreach to, to the rest of the world and, and, and its involvement in geopolitics. Yeah. So that became a that became the next more likely choice for me to go to. Yeah. So I'm contributing hopefully in different ways. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Singapore now is quite uh, active in, uh, you know, uh, against the cyber attack, and we have even the center, which is I think the former uh, Estonian prime minister during the, the attack in uh, 2007 is uh, now right now in Singapore. I don't know whether you mm -hmm. you are familiar with it, but uh, I want to learn from you uh, against all the uh, cyber attack and you know cyber security. Um, that is actually not my view, but I can just share a bit of um, of, of uh, what happened in Singapore recently and why we think uh, um, cyber security is so important. Um, recently in Singapore, uh, our healthcare system was um, hacked and they targeted specifically the health uh, information of the Prime Minister. So, so when, and when I mean health uh, records, I mean uh, the kind of treatment, the, the kind of medication, you know, and his uh, health condition. So, so basically, uh, such information um, was, was stolen. Um, it's not, perhaps uh, from, you know, bigger countries will look at this attack and think that it's, it's not important because only um, 1.5 million records were stolen, uh, prime ministers included. Um, you know, um, it's not really of much importance. But then again, it's um, it's one of it's, it's the first major attack uh, that um, were, that that the hackers got successful. You know, um, to date, there have been always been a lot of uh, other uh, smaller scale cyber attacks, but this one was was pretty much large scale, and um, it in, instead um, number one, it really tests our our. Um, cyber security um, um, readiness. So the, the healthcare system obviously is not ready. So it's, it's not in line with whatever the country is, um, whatever the government is generally pushing for. Uh, you please don't be surprised to find that in Singapore, we, we also have government departments who don't really want to follow whatever the top says, you know, um, yeah, no matter how efficient we are. So, um, and, and in terms of uh, strategic security, um, the, the Singapore Ministry, uh, Ministry of Defence actually um, has, has put aside money to hire white hat, white hat uh, hackers to come in and hack their system and to tell them where uh, they are weak at and so that they can up the, the system a bit more. So um, I'm sure um, you know, this is why we invite um, experts from all over the world, including the, 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 the Estonian uh, president you mentioned, yeah, to, to, to come and share experiences and, and, and all that because, uh, again, the, the, the government always like to say it's not a matter of it's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when. It's not if it happens, it's when it happens. So, uh, being a very forward-looking government, uh, the Singapore government always likes to push, you know, for for to be to be prepared, yeah. I, I hope that answers your question. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry.
Good afternoon again, everyone. And I think when you look at the, the symposium that we call ASEAN CMU Think Tank Connectivity of People to People, so we listen for the three um, experts. One as a director from the ASE or AUN this morning. So it's impressed me and you know think about the way that people in, in ASEAN in these regions can uh, bring together more than uh, just like the economic cooperations. We have another things that we can learn a lot from exchange the cultures, you know. And the, the, the thing that we call people to people also make us to think uh, in the way that not only the paper, only the, uh, the agenda that we wrote on the, uh, you know, on, the, on the, the paper, like I mentioned. So when I first saw four scholars yesterday, actually we had talked something else uh, beyond our, uh, you know, the, the four people presentations. But it made uh, me think that, wow, this is the first time that I have friends from below us and as a think tank level, even one of them that we have met before in China. And the fishery industry in the Philippines and also the agenda that um, from two countries of Brunei and also Malaysia is proposed. And it made me have some, uh, you know, golden sentence that, that remind me that our center had to move forward by bringing more uh, dimensions. Even we stay in the north, but like I already mentioned, it's not every 10 countries have to be stay on the same panel. Even uh, Dr. Dori asked, why we have just nine countries? But sometimes we don't need to have just nine or 10, you know, because Director Chotin uh, just mentioned that five students from Thailand can perform one shows. And it make more connectivity and shows that I, the common, you know, like identity of the five, uh, you know, students from Thailand. So last but not least, I would like to say thank you very much for to everybody. And we also give us such mentions about the, the dialogues of the economy. And it made me have to think harder that, wow, we have just 600 and also 600 million people in this region. But the thing that we had uh, and, uh, questions from about the environmental problem that happened in Laos, what about the investment that we have to be careful about, you know, like the, the pros and the cons. So this thing can make me stop having such a, this kind of symposium and dialogue in, in, in alternative ways. So please allow me to, uh, give some excuse and we make some mistake about the you know the platform but you know don't make me wrong that we want to make our regions into the way of like connectivity. So we start from people to people. So it's so time for me to say thank you very much for everyone and have a wonderful you know Friday. So T G I F. So we still have a coffee you know outside before you step out. So have a separate back home. Thank you very much.